What happens when an entire region is demographically transformed virtually overnight? What does it look like when an indigenous group is replaced and or assimilated into a foreign nation? Pretty much everyone's aware of how the Europeans conquered and transformed the American continents, with each country now being a highly unique territory in terms of genetics and culture, but fewer people are aware of the Turco-Mongol conquests of Central Asia around the same time, which also fundamentally changed the population as well, as I discussed recently, replacing the Western Eurasian Indo-Europeans with the now highly mixed Turkic Central Asians, which is why I refer to the Turkic peoples as the Latinos of Asia. Nearby, however, a region larger than any other country on Earth was also completely changed in a much shorter time period. A region that has entered global vernacular as a synonym for frozen, barren wastelands, often referred to as North Asia, but more commonly known as Siberia, every Soviet distant and political prisoner's worst nightmare. What is Siberia exactly? Well, there's not really a cut and dry definition. According to the Russians, the Siberian Federal District consists of this collection of administrative divisions, most of which are known as oblasts, the Russian equivalent of a U.S. state, which are located north of Kazakhstan, stretching up to the Arctic Ocean in the north. However, traditionally, the term Siberia was used to refer to all of Russia east of the Ural Mountains, over three-fourths of its total land area, but conversely less than a fourth of the country's population, and this stretches from the Urals in the west, not too far from Ukraine and Eastern Europe, all the way to the Sea of Japan in the Far East, and the Bering Strait as well, being the border between Russia and North America, with Alaska being only 50 miles away, although some islands are of course even closer. This creates a bit of a conundrum when attempting to define different North Asian, East Asian, Central Asian, Eastern European, and Native American civilizations, as there was heavy overlap between different regions. Historically, there were no distinct borders and definitions, so Siberia saw a huge range of different peoples inhabit its landscape. The most famous, or rather infamous of which, would clearly be the Mongols, who spread out throughout nearly all of Eurasia, although ironically, despite being incredibly close to the Mongol homeland and being nearly uninhabited and defenseless, making conquests extremely easy, the Mongols never attempted to incorporate the northern portions of Siberia, most likely because they knew there would be little to no compensation in doing so. However, going back even further than this, it becomes rather murky when attempting to divide between the major extended regionalized ancestral continuums, as one group that formerly inhabited southern Siberia and Central Asia is known as the Ancient North Eurasians, or A&E, a unique ancestral continuum that most likely diverged from Western Eurasians thousands of years ago. This A&E component was dominant in most of Siberia for most of human history in the Eurasian landmass until further waves of migration from Eastern and Western Eurasia came to this region and intermixed with the indigenous A&E populations. Now, what fascinates people the most is the fact that the first Amerindians actually originated in Siberia and heavily intermixed with the ancient North Eurasians, which is how haplogroup Q came to dominate most Native American groups, and which is where many believe haplogroup R originates from among the Amerindians of North America today, although others believe this is merely from later European admixture or from an ancient group of Europeans known as the Solutrians who crossed the Atlantic. Interestingly, the a &E component is actually higher in Amerindian populations the further south you go in the continents, meaning most of the indigenous peoples of South America are actually closer to the a &E base than those from the north, which makes sense seeing as to how those in the north are closer to eastern Eurasians since more recent migration waves have impacted them, but more on that in a later video. Therefore, modern Europeans are more closely related genetically to indigenous Siberians and Native Americans than they are to East Asians, as they don't have this ancient North Eurasian component that has heavily affected the gene pools of the former two populations, but the bulk of their ancestry is still derived from later Eastern Eurasian migrations, although heavily dependent on group and diverged significantly in the case of most Amerindians around 10 to 15,000 years. These new migrations brought many different ethno-linguistic groups, although some have yet to still be fully understood, with the groups most are familiar with being Uralic, Turkic, Tungusic, and Mongolic peoples, although some of the smaller groups include the Nivk, 
Yukagir, Chukchi, Koryak, and Idleman, who are sometimes simply grouped together as Paleo-Siberians as a term of convenience, although their linguistic and genetic relations have yet to be completely explored. Although it's been found that the Nivk and, to a lesser extent, Kamchatkan peoples do have a moderate genetic link to the Ainu, who also inhabited Sakhalin at one point. The majority of indigenous Siberian peoples belong to paternal haplogroup N, which originates from somewhere in the Far East, likely in modern-day China, even though this is dominant in many groups regardless of ethno-linguistic affiliations such as the Turkic Yakuts, the Uralic Finns, Baltic Lithuanians, or even some Tungusic tribes in the Far East. Perhaps the most unique group would be the Yenisian or Ket people in central Siberia, who have one of the higher degrees of a &E ancestry in Siberia, and are strongly believed to be genetically related to some of the first migrants to the Americas, showing their common origin, and it's accepted by many linguists that they belong to the Sam family as the Na Dene group of Amerindians in North America, making it one of the few confirmed cross-continental linguistic connections between Asia and the Americas, as they are one of the few Amerindian groups to belong to haplogroup C, common in North and Central Asia, showing their more recent origins, and it's also been proposed that they may have been distantly related to the Sino-Tibetan family as well, although with less support. Also, although heavily divergent, the Ainu and now extinct Jomans of Japan and Sakhalin are also believed to have originated in Siberia before migrating to Japan, and hence, although distant, are genetically related to many Eastern Siberian groups. The Buryats of Russia, the northernmost Mongolic-speaking group, are essentially assimilated Turkic and Tungusic tribes of southern Siberia, and hence are closely related to them and belong mostly to haplogroup N, as opposed to most ethnic Mongols who are haplogroup C. Many Indo-European groups had been settling in Siberia since the Afanasyevan period roughly four to 5,000 years ago, but Turkic groups such as the Bulgars, Kipchaks, Khazars, and others quickly became dominant in this region, intermixing with the older populations such as the Scythians or Euralians, and hence the Turkic people in the Volga region of Siberia are more ethnically mixed than those in the east. After the rise and fall of Genghis' empire, these Volga Turks would split into groups like the Tatars and Bashkirs, eventually creating the Khanate of Sibir, the northernmost Islamic state to ever exist. However, in the 16th century, a rapidly expanding Russia looked to the vastly underpopulated Siberia to their east and began their conquest of the region, with the Cossacks, headed by Yermak Timifeyevich, being infamously, let's say, efficient in their subjugation of the Siberian, which reflects the conquest of the Native Americans by European powers such as the Spanish across the Pacific. As the Russians and Cossacks expanded further east, they assimilated many of the Uralic-speaking groups north of Moscow, such as the Volga Finns, and this group of Slavicized Uralians gave rise to the Pomars in the far north near the Arctic Ocean, who also had significant Norse influence as well from contact with Norwegian fishers and traders, but eventually the Pomars lost their unique dialect and identity. Many of the ethnic Russians in Siberia today are actually the result of Russified Ukrainians, Germans, Poles, Jews, or others, which, in addition to the Pomors mentioned earlier, does call into question the ethnic identity of the Russian people as a whole. But really, there are very few genetically or culturally homogenous groups out there anyways, and as to how many ethnic Russians in the area today have any recent Siberian ancestry whatsoever is unknown, as I've yet to see a study on the subject. But if I were to take a guess, it'd probably be no more than 5 or 10% in the East, similar to the number of whites in Northern America that have Amerindian ancestry. Therefore, Russia is very distinguished from other European nations, all of whom are minuscule in size when compared to the behemoth that is Russia, and hence is more comparable to colonial settler states such as Canada or the United States, albeit having a more centralized ethnic identity rooted in the Slavic peoples. Worth noting is that some native Siberians also assisted in the settlement and colonization of Alaska, and today a small portion of Alaska has ancestry from sub-Siberian groups as well as the Russians, a group some have dubbed Russian Alaskan Creoles, and although they no longer speak the Russian language, they do have many cultural similarities such as their adherence to the Orthodox Christian Church, the only group native to the United States to do so.
Some Aleutian tribes are even native to the Chitotka Autonomous Okrug in far eastern Siberia. So it does draw into question the division between Northeast Asians and Amerindians as very few groups actually have clean distinctions. Here's the distribution of Western and Eastern Eurasian DNA in a dichotomous breakdown of Siberian peoples. And thus, in a situation similar to Central Asia, North Asia can be thought of as a hybridized region. Keep in mind, this is only a two-way division, and if we were to add more variable populations, we would be able to see more connections between these groups, creating a collage that shows how diverse, yet interconnected, most Siberians are. And by looking at a map of the Siberian region, we can see that Western Eurasian ancestry predictably decreases the further east you go, generally speaking, with some Kamchatkan groups being far more closely related to East Asians, although keep in mind the Kamchadals are actually a sort of Creole group group, consisting of the mixed descendants of Russians, Koryaks, Edelmans, and other Siberian peoples. The Turkic and Uralic peoples of Siberia are virtually the only group that managed to avoid complete devastation, and today in the Far East, ethnic Russians and other Europeans make up well over 90% of the population, although the Turkic Yakuts are still prevalent in the Sakha Republic, and Tungusic and Paleo-Siberian peoples still dot the landscape. During Soviet rule, and even before, the native Siberian culture, which is incredibly diverse, was heavily suppressed by the state. But ever since the fall of the Soviet Union, in some parts of Northern Asia, there has somewhat been a recovery of native Siberian groups, with a mass exodus of ethnic Russians and other Slavs from some traditional Siberian homelands, and the promotion of their indigenous cultures and customs, and even many partaking in organized religious groups once more, including their indigenous practices. And there has also been a minor movement of Siberian peoples to other parts of the former USSR, as well as the United States. So although many native Siberian peoples have had quite a tragic history of war, genocide, and disease, they remain one of the most interesting groups of related, but not so related peoples on the planet. And apparently, you guys agree as well. By the way, Mason Men, I rarely ever talk about this kind of stuff, but I have a subreddit called Mesa Stan that I created over a year ago, actually, to share my own personal cartographic creations, and also for people to post anything related to geography, history, or demography. And I generally post the maps and charts I create for each video about a day in advance on the sub before I release my latest video, a bundle I refer to as the Mesa Maps. Very creative, I know. So be sure to check it out, but before, for today's poll, let me know which native Siberian group you'd like to learn more about. And as always, this has been Mason, thanks for watching everyone, and I'll see you next time.